you to everyone for joining this session, which is about documentation. Um, and as probably everyone knows, documentation forms a large part of quality control. And it kind of goes without saying that basically, if you don't write it down, then you might as well have not done it, which is why there's so much documentation in quality control. So I'd like to hand over now to um, our speaker, who's Jean-Paul Assam Assam. So a big welcome to him. Um, I believe he's a senior lecturer at the University of Douala, I hope I've pronounced that correctly, in Cameroon. And so I'll hand over to Jean-Paul now. Thank you. What is a good documentation practice? Uh, the document is an information. That information can be a paper, a CD, a computer file. So the document, document provides information or evidence or may serve has an official record. So what is a record? A record is a document stating result achieve or provide uh, so result achieve or provide are documents that uh, provide recommended practices has uh, instruction. We have also uh, a policy we, we, we use a the term policy in uh, documentation is a plan or adopt course uh, or principle of action intended to influence and uh, determine and determine the, the of an uh, organization. We have also uh, what we call a procedure. Uh, we have a, a, an example, a standard operating procedure that are. Uh, a document that uh, we use to carry uh, some uh, activity or uh, a process. Next. Can we have the next slide, please, Bonnie? Okay, uh, practice. So uh, a good documentation practice has to be legible, means that everyone should be able to read what is written regardless of who, where, or what has been written. That is very, very important. Information that is understood by all customer he has all to be uh, trustable uh, who recorded the document and uh, he has to be uh, contemporaneous. Uh, the information should be documented at the correct time frame along with flow. Long lasting and durable, he has to be also uh, accessible. Uh, that is very, very important. Next. Now the purpose, so it's very important to notice that uh, the quality and system. Uh, all that is very important. So sometimes we, we used to say uh, what is not documented uh, to, to, to have uh, all the documents, all, all the, the I documented so to provide the basic guide of good document practice with relation or error uh, verification and short documented evidence and audit trail for of data for control of process ensures all staff knows what to do, how to do it, and when to, to do it, and also to improve the, the, the performance of, uh, of an organ. Next slide, please.
So now, the uh, what are the essential document require for a quality management uh, system? So we have uh, so much. It's important to know those who are required for a quality management system. Uh, we can have the quality uh, or an, a quality uh, policy. We can have a. Uh, uh, we have the, the laboratory analytical plan, the laboratory reference standard, the laboratory notebook, the, the temperature ch uh, chart, the equipment service and maintenance uh, record. We have also the corrective action and the preventive uh, uh, control, uh, control record. Uh, these are some. Uh, essential document required. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so um, Jean Paul was just going over the structure of the quality management system there. Uh, the pyramid structure, so the important uh, part of it. Obviously a quality manual, which includes your quality policy, your quality procedures and your work instructions and the quality records. Can I have the next slide, please? So um, the system is based on ISO 15189, and that sets out um, a number of principles by which the uh, setup is done around the quality manual and policy. And that's such that the laboratory shall control documents required by the quality management system and ensure that the unintended use of obsolete documents is prevented. So having good document control uh, ensures that. So for example, you don't want to end up with say a risk assessment that was done and is out of date and people are working by that and new chemicals, for instance, have been introduced and they're not uh, risk assessed or an SOP that has changed. So the system uh, controls the documentation. So all controlled documents must be identified. So they must have a title, a unique identifier on each page, the date of the current version and or the version number. So that controls and everyone knows which version that they're working to. They need to have a page number and total number of pages so that you, for instance, don't know uh, if you don't know that you've lost a page that's uh, on the back of the document, uh, if you don't know the total number of pages that should be there. An authority of issue. So it's been signed off. It's not in a draft format. Um, and then current authorised versions and their distribution should be identified by means of a master index list. So uh, the department knows what documents that should be in the department and documents aren't lost. For instance, somebody leaves, they don't have all of the documents on their uh, computer and then nobody knows what documents. So there should be a centralized master list index. Can I have the next slide, please? Okay, so this is an example of an SOP template um, that's used in Jean-Paul's laboratory. And you can see, that um, if you have a template such as this, it means that all this information is always captured and not forgotten because lots of people will be writing these documents um, and then it's signed off and checked that everything's captured correctly. Um, and I guess that's one of the good things, there's a lot of templates out there available. So if you're starting this <clears throat> kind of procedure in your laboratory, it's good to get examples from other laboratories and templates, so you're not completely starting from scratch. Okay, could I have the next slide, please? Okay, this is an example of an SOP template. Um, okay, so just listing, um, the aspects of this document and what are the precautions and safety, calibration, QC, et cetera, and if this is uh, required for the method that um, this uh, SOP is talking about. Could I have the next slide, please? Okay, and this is an example from um, Jean-Paul's lab of a document master list here. Um, so, I mean, there's different ways of doing this, and this is just an example, but I guess the key things are the document number, 
uh, the effective date um, and then uh, revision number and basically all the document control numbers are on here. And then um, the all the different documents that are held in this laboratory that have been created um, so they could be referred to. Could I get the next slide, please? Okay, this is a, just, uh, I think, another example of a master list index. So if I could get the next slide, please. And again, next slide, please. Okay, document control process. So, um, so this is to approve documents for adequacy prior to issue by authorised staff. I think we've talked about importance of approval. Um, review and update documents as necessary. So you set a, re, um, a review date, so you decide what will be appropriate and that will be based on um, what you decide in the laboratory. So it might be a year or some documents might be two years, but you set that. And then after, if there are changes that happen during that period of time, then you may need to obviously do uh, an update and that will be documented and it will become like a version, a new version of that document. Um, ensure the current relevant versions of applicable documents are available at points of use. That's really important. So this comes into archiving documents and ensuring. So you don't want loads of paper copies of documents hanging around. So it's good to have things online as much as possible um, and then not print out lots of documents and have them because it can mean that there are obsolete versions of documents that people are working from. But that's all about training um, of your lab staff to ensure that they know that a new version has been released. And if you have, you document the places where that document is kept and then everyone can refer to those. Uh, to ensure the documents remain legible and readily identifiable. Ensure the documents of external origin are identified. So yes, that's one thing you've got to it's kind of hard because you can't give them your own uh, version number, et cetera. So they'll be outside of your system of how to uh, to deal with those documents, but they still will have their own version, etc. So you need to document that within your documentation to, to say which version of that document that you're referring to. So that obviously as those policies in another organisation change, you are referring to the correct uh, document. Uh, prevent the unintended use of obsolete documents. We've talked about that. Can I get the next slide, please? what is required for control. So the whole point of control and documented information is to make sure it's available, current and suitable for use and also protected. So identification, how is documented information identified? So I think we've talked about that uh, with having the title and the uh, review numbers, etc. And the format, what is the best format? So obviously, you want to make things clear. You want um, a standardized format for your documentation. It makes it easier for your users to read um, and absorb the information because it does end up that you have people reading a lot of documents in the lab and you want to simplify the information as much as possible so that the message is not lost amongst the detail. Review and approval. When a new document is found or is created, how is it approved for release? So there's a system, you need to write an SOP to say how that approval process goes um, with who approves it. And the structure of the organization is very important here so that you have this defined in your quality manual. It comes to who your senior lead is, your laboratory manager, your quality manager, and the people who work in the lab and everybody's role so that um, you know uh, the review approval process. I say, and distribution, access, retrieval and use. How will you provide access to release documents? Um, so we've talked a bit about trying to minimize the number of paper copies, but to ensure that people can have access. So for instance, you might have a shared drive and you give access to the relevant people on that drive so that they're able to, to get those documents. Could I get the next uh, slide, please? Mm -hmm. Um, storage, oh, what's called? storage and preservation, how do you protect, protect the documented information from unauthorized changes? So, um, so for instance, it, um, you can have PDF version yeah. documents on a shared drive and those are signed off. Um, and obviously you educate your staff not to 
change PDFs or you can change PDFs, but it's harder than say a Word document. So that protects documents to some extent. Um, and you can instigate maybe like a signage process for instance, DocuSign to people can sign to say that they've read those documents. So you've got a record that people are aware of that document and they've read it. Um, control of changes, what changes are made and how to identify them. So if there's changes required uh, within the period when it's not being reviewed, then this can be done, but obviously you need to update that version to um, incorporate that. And then the signage list will have to be sent out again to capture that everybody's aware of those changes. Retention and disposition. How do you print these obsolete documents? So I guess we can talk about some of these things a bit more in the question and answer session. It'd be really good as well to get people's input on how different people deal with this, because everyone does things slightly different. So I've made some suggestions earlier in the presentation. <coughs> external documents, how do you find and control documents from external sources? We've talked about that. Document master copy. So each controlled document has one master copy. This is the copy to which all change initially made, of which further copies are made and issued as required. So yes, you tend to have the document master list or a document master folder um, where you know those are the uh, copies. There might be a few uh, copies of that exact same document where they're required. Can I get the next slide, please? Common documentation errors. Okay, so missing signature at dates at the time the activity is performed. So yes, yeah, so maybe somebody's written a draft document, they're waiting for someone to review it and that activity has gone ahead. Um, and that's not really okay, because obviously if you then issued results, for instance, in the clinical lab um, and you can't go back and that would be a non-conformance, so you would have to correct that afterwards, but those dates will never match up. So um, you then have to make some kind of non-conformance document and say how you resolve that, but then um, and learn from that process. The write over, um, I don't know what that means, but maybe it means crossing something out and writing on some a document, but that's obviously not okay. So if something has changed, the document needs to be reviewed and then a new version issued. A non-uniform data signature entry. Again, I think that's uh, the, perhaps a procedure being undertaken before the document's been signed off. Mm -hmm. Writing a note that activity was performed on one day and signed mm -hmm. off on another day. Okay, so that's perhaps somebody in a hurry in the lab. Um, they haven't uh, done an activity. They've done an activity. They didn't fill out the documentation, and they think, "Oh, I'll do it tomorrow." But that's not okay because things get missed. Um, it's really important to fill out uh, documentation at the time that the activity is done. So blank spaces, again, perhaps there's partial information missing on a sample and someone knows they can go and cut it from the computer, but they think, oh, I'll do it later and then it gets forgotten. Illegible writing, so not knowing what the number or the letter, et cetera, is. Um, that can obviously lead to confusion between samples and too many corrections. So this is filling out um, say a uh, form in the laboratory uh, while the sample is being processed. So better to print another form and to, to make sure that it's not really untidy because no one can read it. Okay, could I get the next slide please? Okay, principles of good documentation practice for compliance. So document bearing original signatures should never be destroyed. So that's about archiving. So uh, when you write your quality manual, you put a whole section in there about archiving and you describe how you will archive your documents. Um, so what will happen to them when they obviously become obsolete? You don't destroy it, you always have to have a record so you can go back over time. So for instance, in a clinical trial, you can look at the whole history of the documentation covering uh, that clinical trial um, and anyone who comes in to audit you, so uh, they might ask for that documentation, they might want to go right back through the history to know documents should be destroyed. Never falsify information, so if there's been something that happens there should be like a no blame policy in the lab where you identify what's happened and you put into place um, process to ensure it doesn't happen again and that then involves training and moving forward from that. Never white out and cover up, use cover up tape. So yeah, so you can't um, do that. You can't sort of stick something over and then correct it. So I think, you know, the important thing is something, if something is corrected, it's initialed 
um, and it's very clear that there was a mistake rather than trying to hide that. Never obliterate information or records, so it's spoken about that. Never overwrite a record, same thing, I think. Oh, well, I guess in, the, um, in your LM, uh, laboratory information management system, uh, they tend to be created so you can't do that. So you can't, um, if you write in something and then you want to change it, um, there's like a record that that's happened, a record of the original information. So for instance, if you entered somebody's date of birth incorrectly and you wanted to change that, it must be a record that's been changed because otherwise it's more easy to change something accidentally um, or data to be lost. So it's really, really important. Um, and basically to have, a, it's good to have some kind of system that speaks to these things rather than um, say, for instance, an Excel spreadsheet where data can very easily be lost um, or written over. Never use pencil because obviously it could be rubbed out and then uh, written over easily. Uh, blue or black ink as standard. So no spaces, lines are filled to be left blank because it's not known then whether there was information that's been missed. So you can strike through to show that that information wasn't relevant for that sample, for instance. Never use symbols, ditto marks or arrows. So a lot of the filling out of documentation is very repetitive, but unfortunately you just have to, to live with that and learn that system. Can I get the next slide, please? benefits of good documentation. So build confidence in the LQS system. So um, yeah, so I think that's it. It's really important that you get your laboratory staff to buy into the system to understand why it's important because it can be very laborious at times. But I think if you've got your staff on board and they understand the importance of it and how it will improve the lab, lab they will buy into that system. Um, and I think at the beginning it can be hard, but then over time, um, people tend to really respond to that. Uh, reduce efforts to compliance with regulatory bodies. Um, I'm not sure quite what it means by that, sorry. Um, allows for achievements of required uh, results. Correct, complete, current and consistent information effectively meets customers and stakeholders requirements. So yes, yeah, so you always have your customer and your stakeholder. So your customer might be your patient or say a doctor taking the sample, uh, getting the data from you that's coming out of the samples you're analyzing. And part of your quality management system will uh, name your customers and stakeholders. And also to talk about how you're evaluated on those um, the criteria. So for instance, you might have a system in place to uh, measure how good your assay is for something. So for instance, you'll get samples sent to you that are known by an organization, the known um, um, drug concentration, for instance, and you will measure them in your system um, and see how well they perform. And then you, you submit your results and then you pass or fail to test. So you're always testing your systems. Um, enables the laboratory activities to be arranged into functional work patterns for specific action. Um, I'm also not quite sure about that, sorry. Okay, so if we could have the next slide, please. Benefits of good documentation. So create structures that start and systematically coordinate uh, conduct business. Everybody knows what they're doing. And also training of laboratory staff is really important. So that's, uh, for instance, each person has a training folder and they've done, they've got a record of current GCLP and GCP training. They've been trained in the various procedures uh, in the laboratory. So then if you get audited, they may well ask for the training records of the staff to see if people are trained. So it's obviously a safety aspect there and a results aspect. And then solve complicated problems. So sometimes it's not straightforward. Um, you know, something's a bit out of range. Can you accept that reagent? Or you've had a supply problem and the reagent's gone slightly out of date. Can you accept that? And solving these kind of problems, if you've got a good system in place, you have got a good record of QC, et cetera, um, you should be well placed to then solve those kind of more complicated problems. Reduce or eliminate assumptions and second guessing. So yes, yeah, so it's if, you know, a lab member of staff isn't quite sure about something, they should know who they can report to um, and uh, 
get some backup and know how to resolve that rather than saying, oh, I think I'll just do it like this um, and then it not being correct. Eliminate the need to re-ask the same questions. So if you've got a good system in place, you know exactly how waste should be disposed of, for instance, somebody doesn't have to keep re-asking how that's done and specify clear instructions for staff. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so that's, that's uh, the rest of Jean-Paul's um, presentation. I'm really sorry that I had to do it because I obviously haven't covered it quite how he would have done, but hopefully that's given us an overview anyway. So thank you to Jean-Paul and sorry that your connection prevented you from giving all of your presentation. Um, so uh, we're at 11 o'clock now and we've got quite a bit of time uh, for question and answer. So let's have a look at the chat. Um, and we can see um, what people are thinking and then questions. And we've got, so I just want to introduce the panel actually. So that's myself, John Tembo, who obviously was introduced in the last session. So thank you, John. Um, and Davis Kuchaka, who I believe is from Kilimanjaro Clinical Research Institute in Tanzania. So Davis, are you there? Hello. Uh, yeah, yes, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm around. Hi, Davis. Thank you. It's great that you're on the panel. So I think that we basically can take some questions um, and, uh, you know, let's have a discussion because lots of labs are putting in place um, documentation systems, etc. And, you know, what works in one lab, it's great to have kind of wisdom sharing. You know? um, so I think I have been so perhaps uh, John and Davis can help me out, and then John Paul, if you're back, that would be great. So, if we can just have the panel there, so that's Isabel, John Paul, John, John, and Davis. Um, perhaps we can start with. I can see in the chat some of the questions where we had something from Nazreen Ismail was asking, "Do we have to have a paper cop master copy?" Can it be an electronic or controlled copy? And I know Vernon Masale was replying there saying it's nice to print out a paper copy occasionally for our archives, but with all the many multiple SOPs that we have now, it's often easier to keep electronic copies for master copies. So perhaps the panel could start with that question, please. Okay. Um, Davis, would you like to take this? Because um, you're probably sick of hearing my voice for a bit. Uh, yeah, um, I think uh, with technology, um, it's also acceptable to have the, an electronic copy. But uh, since since uh, um, the, the the workshop is intended for lower middle income countries, we know the challenges we have in in, in Africa, as we have already um, witnessed that we couldn't make it. With uh, with John because of uh, internet problem, so that also can happen. So I think it's uh, the best option is to have these paper copies of the document so that you can always have them whenever you need them. Thanks for that, Davis. And I think it's really important for some documents like SOPs. People might need to refer to them directly in the lab uh, for the, making sure they get the method. Um, correctly done so um, I think that's a really good point does anyone else have anything to say about that we can move on if not we, we've got a question here Isabel from Emmanuel Adebia who's saying assuming the review date is due but there are no changes made after reviewing the document first of all do you need to reprint the whole document and second of all, do you need to change the approval date, et cetera? Um, maybe I can take that. So I guess um, you need to make it clear that you have done the review because otherwise your document is going to look like it's out of date, even though you've read it and you know that there's no um, changes. But how you do a review can be decided by you and it can be captured, be captured in your quality manual. So, you know, it might be that you, you can write on that document and say, but it's better really to, to uh, maybe keep the version number or change the date. Or, um, so I don't know, what do other people think? I think you, you are right, Isabel. 
So I guess we just, the most important thing is that what you do, you, you do what you say that you will do in your quality manual and you think about how you will do that. And then um, sometimes things work and sometimes they don't. And then you have to change how you've done it. But um, as long as you do what you say that you're going to do, then that's fine. But so if, if you said you're going to review a document every two years and there's no changes, then you need to in some way show that you have done that review. Okay, we've got a few more questions. Someone saying, what's the difference between blank space and illegible writing? So yes, I guess illegible writing is a problem, but um, I guess that's a training thing. If you have culprits who always write illegibly, you have to, to retrain to make sure they're aware of how important it is. Um, and blank space, yes. So if you can't read it, it's pretty much the same as legible writing. But the point with blank space is that you strike through that space so that you know that there's nothing, no information to be recorded there. Does anybody else have anything to add on that? We've got a question here from Guy Arnul Rogue, pardon for my terrible pronunciation, asking what is a laborat what are laboratory analytical plans? Okay, does someone else want to take that? John, do you want to take that? So... Well, maybe Ken might have something to say about that because I think that might be more slightly more related to our first presentation. If Ken's still with us. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, an equal plan, um, when um, when the study is going to be done, you have uh, the document, that document, how the process is going to be done. Um, for, um, the document that is made for the laboratory that summarizes uh, or the part of, um, can you remind me of what the document that is written when you're going to do a study? The document that you're going to be you're going to do a study. The document that is if you're going to do a study, we have a protocol. So if you have a protocol, protocol is huge. There's a lot of docu a lot of doc content in the protocol. So it's called the protocol contains what is going to be done in the pharmacy, what's going to be done at the field, at the clinical site. Um, the uh, data management, so many things at the laboratory. So we cannot use this protocol in the laboratory. So instead of um, taking the whole protocol, okay, we'll still read it in the laboratory. So instead of taking the protocol in the laboratory, we take the parts, the part of the protocol that is relevant to the laboratory. And that is what we call analytical plan. So you write it in details. It, all the details, all the procedures, and what we are the intention of what we are going to do in the laboratory that was captured in, in, in brief in the protocol is put in detail in the uh, analytical plan. So we call it laboratory analytical plan. And some places they call it LOM, laboratory operational plan. So laboratory operational plan is the same as laboratory analytical plan. So you entail all the people who are going to be involved should be included there. All the tests that are going to be done the equipment, their source, all the reagents that are going to be used in the, uh, in the study are going to be detailed in the analytical plan. So that's what we call laboratory analytical plan. Some people call it laboratory operational plan. Okay, thank you for that, Ken, that's great. So we've got a few more questions here. Someone saying, which is the best way to manage a master list in cases where different sets of documents have varying review dates? Um, so I guess you know, you're going to have to update your master list uh, copy each time when you change um, a document if you've got your review dates on that document. So uh, one thing that you can try and do when you're so for instance when you're referring to other documents in your so for instance an SOP 
if you're referring to a risk assessment, it's good not to refer to a specific version number because what it means is that when that risk assessment version three, for instance, goes out of date, that it makes all of your other documents out of date. So if you just refer to that, the master number of that document, and it will then always, that document will always stay in date. Um, you don't always have to go and change every single document, but you will have to update your master list regularly if you have your review dates on there. Um, but you, I mean, I guess you don't necessarily have to have your review dates on your on your master list document. You can uh, control your dates in a, in a different way that you choose. For instance, um, you may choose a different way of controlling your date changes. So you don't always have to update that. Um, but it's just about deciding what works for you. I don't know if anyone else has anything to add to that. No. So there's another question here. Is the quality manual the same as the quality policy? Does somebody, do someone else on the panel want to take that? Davis, would you like to take that? Uh, I think there's a difference between a quality manual and a policy. Uh, a quality manual is, um, is a document which you explain the whole uh, concept of quality management system. Whereas a policy is just a statement which uh, explains what needs to be done as far as the quality management system is concerned. So in a quality manual, that's where you put all the information of what is happening within the laboratory. But a policy is just a statement which tells us uh, what needs to be done as far as uh, quality is concerned. Absolutely, thanks for that, David. Okay, so um, we have a question. Uh, hi, how is the electronic data managed? So I guess you have to decide that in your lab. I think Sean Paul might be back on, so I don't know if Sean Paul wants to take that. Is he on the library? No. Maybe you can't hear me. Um, so, I, yeah, I mean, you can have a, a system, a laboratory management system, and some, I mean, there is some cost in setting those up, and sometimes they're not very flexible, and you have to have somebody write some codes to kind of customize it to your lab, um, or you can, you know, use just other systems that we talked about, just having PDFs of your documents um, and shared drives and control and maybe DocuSign. It's is not an expensive service to sign off your documents, et cetera. Um, but you can, as long as your system works for you, then it's fine because it's not stipulated exactly what you have to do. These systems have to be developed. Um, and then when you're audited, uh, they'll see whether your system has ended up being fit for purpose, basically. So we haven't really talked about audits. I don't know if... Is that later on or should we talk a bit about audits now? Auditing is covered in the second day. Is it? Okay, sorry. I will, I will. <laughs> no problem. Okay, after how many times or years procedures supposed to be revised? Someone's asked, that's a really good question. Um, John, would you like to take that? And if John's there. Okay, I can take that otherwise. Um, so, I mean, basically you decide there will be a recommendation and perhaps if you look at labs, other labs and see what they do and then adopt something. So it'll be usually it's somewhere between one and two years depending on the document um, of how you, but you have to, again, you have to do what you say you're going to do. So if you say that you're going to review your risk assessments every year, then you have to do it. Um, but it doesn't mean that you say, well, I'm not going to review my risk assessments for five years because I don't want to have to do that because it has to be realistic. So generally it's somewhere between about one or two years that you'd expect to review that document. Um, and your policies might be so every two years and your risk sets every one year but you decide uh, what is applicable in your setup because obviously your labs are different and the systems that you're using uh, and what your, your out research output, et cetera, uh, may be different. I think that's true. Correct me if I'm wrong, but. 
Isabel, just while we're looking at some more questions as well, uh, just to remind everybody, we're going to be putting some templates of those sort of documents on the on the knowledge sharing hub, uh, and we'll put the link to that up later on in the chat for everyone. Thanks. Yeah, and I think you know labs tend to be pretty generous about sharing their documents, and then you can adapt them as well to your setup. And if you look on the internet, there's really good examples of what should go, for instance, into your quality manual and into your quality policy. Um, and each area that needs to be covered, it's not always obvious. Uh, so it's nice to have that checklist. So when you're writing that document, you know, do have a look because there's some really good stuff out there um, that will inform you and help it you write that, those kind of documents. Okay, let's get some more questions. So someone said, when documents are reviewed with that, and oh, I think we've done that one, sorry, I'm getting a bit lost. So someone's asking here, Isabel, do we need to change the version of the master list when we add a new SOP to it? Um, someone else wants to say that, Davis, would you like to take that? Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's important to, to also consider changing the version of the master list because something new has, add, has been added to the, uh, the document. So it is important also to change the version. So that at least you can yes, make can a, a difference between the two. Okay, thank you, David. What, what, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think if you've got, it depends how you set up your master list and if you want to capture review dates on there and, you know, then you are going to have to, every time you change a document, you are going to have to change that master list to reflect that version if you've got version numbers on there. Um, because otherwise then your master list is out of date. So um, but often you tend to have like a batch of documents coming up for review at the same time because when you start writing the documents to the lab, they tend to then be coming up for renew, review around a year or two years. So quite often you might be able to capture multiple documents and update at the same time. But yeah, I mean, you've got to keep everything in date basically. So here's a really good question. Um, so what do you do when an assay SOP is not currently being used? So the assay is not being carried out in the lab, but it's up for review. It could potentially be used in the future and do you still review it? I think that's a really great question. Um, Davis, do you wanna have a go at that? Or we you try and think about how we deal with that? <laughs> Sorry, if you're not speaking, please can you mute your microphone? So we're getting a bit of background noise. Marie, can you mute your microphone, please? Okay, Davis, do you want to have a go at that question? Yeah, can you can you repeat that? Yeah, yeah. So if you. So if there's um, a review due on a document that you're not currently using, say a method, an SOP, um, it's up for review. Do you need to review it? If you're gonna potentially use it in the future, should you still review it at that time if no one's using that method in the lab at the moment? Mm, to me, I think if, if a method is not in use uh, at that particular point, there's no need also to, to, you can just put this as one of the obsolete documents so that when you want to use it, then you can revise it and then start using it. Because what the essence of uh, reviewing a document which you are not using? It. I think that's true. I mean, so you can have an archive uh, section um, where you maybe keep that document or have it sort of on the back burner. I think the most important thing is that it's in date when you do that technique. So if no one's running that technique in the lab at the moment, that's okay. But then if you're gonna come on to using that technique again, it must be um, reviewed and in date before that technique recommences, I think. It doesn't really yeah, matter yeah, where you store that document as long as it's not in the kind of current, if it's out of date, it's not in the current list. Yeah, I think that's also the importance of having uh, the master list SOP updated. You can either add some SOPs or 
remove some of the SOPs which are not in use. Yeah, and I think that's really important because you can end up with loads and loads of documents or loads of things and it does clutter things and you just really want to have your current document so it's very clear for people um, what they need to read and sign off. Let's have a look for any other questions. So thank you for that, Davis. There's a question here saying, what changes to an SOP require a new version number? Do you need to change the version number even when it does not affect the principle or technique of the test? I think that's a really good question. Uh, John, would you like to comment on that? I don't know if John's still on the line with us. Yes, I think I can give oh, a, a answer. Yes. Okay. When you have a, a, a doc, like I can, uh, it's not that uh, you can have a, uh, you can change the, uh, you change the version when you are the SOP. So that can be that can be done. So I think so you can look at it whether it's a minor change or a major change. So, you know, you can have like 1.1, 1 1.2, 1 1.3, 1 and you just, if it's a very minor change, and then you can completely change the version if it's, say, to, from 1 to 2 to 3, if it's a major overhaul. And then you can, I guess you have to have a discussion about what you feel. You know, I think the most important thing is that you document. So on your front cover of a document, you'd say review, and then what you've changed in that version of the document compared to the old document. So you've written, you've got a record of, you know, how major that change was. So if it was, for instance, just a typo or something, you know, whatever yeah. technique was titled wrongly, then you might document that and you'd perhaps just change it to version 1.1 from 1. Um, but if it was a major change to the document, then you'd have to. But if you change the document, you have to change the version number because otherwise you're going to end up with documents that are out of sync with each yeah. other in different places. Jean Paul, we have you back. That's fantastic. I guess yes. let me add on that. Uh, Okay, so someone's asked, what's the advisable period of reviewing documents? I think we've covered that. Um, someone's asking, what is, if your master, this is an Excel type document, do you need to update every time? I think you have to be really careful with Excel because there's no record of um, the changes that have been made. So um, just be very careful. There was a really uh, classic example in the UK with the COVID testing. I don't know if other countries heard about it, but mm -hmm. 16,000 lines of test results were lost because Excel is not really built for um, handling large quantities of data with Gmail on name. So it's really, and there's no kind of checking system to make sure that uh, you haven't lost data or you haven't changed the wrong thing. So just, I would just say, be careful with Excel and put in some systems, uh, have backups um, and know your document trail. So you should capture all of these things in when you write your quality policy, your uh, quality manual, sorry, you'll say, how you will do things and you're at that time think about how you're going to control things and what could go wrong and things always will still go wrong but then you know the whole thing of the quality management system is that it gives you the opportunity to improve things over time so error happens and you improve the system so you're always continuously improving your laboratory Okay, Ken's joined the panel to provide extra support. So that's great. So uh, I can direct some more questions towards Ken as well. Okay, someone said, after reviewing documents, shall we keep original papers? I'm thinking here about the amount of papers we obtain after, for example, 10 years. Uh, Ken, would you like to take that? I don't know if Ken's there. Jean-Paul, would you like to take that? Sorry, sorry, sorry. I was, uh, I was mute. 
<laughs> You're talking to yourself. <laughs> no problem. What's the question? Is it from um, It's the question about obviously if you're reviewing lots of documents and how long to keep the originals for, because you can end up with stashes of documents from like 10 years ago, etc. Um, how long, what's the requirement, how long to keep those documents? I think at some point, if there are documents that are no longer in use, you put them in the yeah. So if they are obsolete, you no longer need to keep them. You can keep them in a separate file or you have to, and if you don't find them of no use, you can actually trash them and get, uh, get rid of them. But there are some that need to go to archives. And you need to take them to the archive because at some point they'll be referred back to um, if there is maybe an audit that's coming after 10 years and somebody wants to see how was it done. So they need to go to the archives. Uh, they can be put in an obsolete file and archived. Yeah, I mean, I think there's specific rules on clinical trials for how long documents need to be held for. So, for instance, um, if you've got uh, lab records of tests and everything that's carried out, but I don't exactly know the answer to that. Someone else probably does. I think it could be 10 years. I don't know if anyone yes, else yeah. know. I think uh, clinical yeah. trials are a bit different as well. It depends on the study. There are study. The study will specify how many years the documents need to be kept. There are studies that require the document to be kept, be kept for 15 years. I work for a study that the study materials will keep, be kept for 30 years. And wow. so it becomes the responsibility of the sponsor to pass the sponsoring of the study to take care of the, the rest of the material for the next 30 years. So the trial site needs to give them back to the sponsoring um, organization to keep the, the, the documents or the materials. Great, but thanks. So basically, if I, check. If I may add on that. Hi, David. Yeah, so I think when it comes to those issues, it also depends on the local laws and uh, regulations. Sometimes you you have your study uh, saying maybe you have to keep the documents so for five years but the local regulation says maybe 10 years so in most cases we usually see what the local regulation says but if the regulations for the study are the most stringent then we follow that yeah thanks it's a really important point that local uh, practice might vary so Okay, so we're coming up to being very close to coffee time. So we can probably just take a couple more questions. Um, I don't know if I can, so some people are answering questions and trying to find some. Somebody's asking if the document is revised and there are no changes, is the version number maintained? Yeah, we, we covered that, I think, because we talked about how you need to just say that you have reviewed it, even if you don't make any changes. If the country has no guideline on the management of laboratory data, how can the laboratory develop and implement data management procedures? Those are, that, Cam? Covered, those are some of the things that need to be covered on in the quality, quality manual. So in your quality manual, Need to detail how the, you are going to control your documents. Yeah, and I think if there's no guidance in your country, then you can definitely look at the guidance in other countries and then adopt something that you think is practical and reasonable uh, for your setting. Uh, yeah. There'll be lots of labs that do similar mm -hmm. things to you. Um, okay. Yeah. Let me just join you. This is I think it's sending soon. Sorry, I can't hear someone's talking. Last one. Are there any prerequisites for a clinical trial monitor to get access to documentation of a lab that houses several research projects? Say that again, sorry. <laughs> the last question is asked, are there any prerequisites for a clinical trial monitor to get access to the documentation of a lab that houses several research projects. Uh, okay, so it's just a confidentiality question, I think. So I don't know who would like to take this. Maybe Davis, would you like to have a go at this one? Uh, 
Um, I think uh, when it comes to confidentiality, the restrictions uh, based on who are, what kind of documents the monitor wants to have access to. Um, anything which relates to the participants, then that should be restricted to the specific uh, monitor or auditor to that particular project. But um, when it comes to documents which relates to instruments like uh, schedules for maintenance, like uh, temperature logs, those, uh, I, mean the, uh, the, I mean, the monitor can have access to those because those has nothing to do with the participant. What we are trying to protect here is the uh, privacy of, of the participants. So a monitor for project X it will only be restricted to uh, participant data related to that particular project. In no other way, a participant from Y can be assessed by uh, a monitor from another uh, clinical trial. So I think we have to set a clear uh, line where that but that uh, monitor can access which kind of data or information on that particular lab. Yeah, that sounds uh, like a very pragmatic and good policy, Davis. So we're one minute over. So in the same uh, vein of uh, John Tembo's first session, we will uh, go to coffee now. I just want to say a big thank you to the panel. Um, and sorry to Jean-Paul for not being able to do his whole presentation. And I, butchered it. Uh, I want to say a big thank you to everyone for their questions and input, because that's the most valuable part really of this workshop and it's great to have a really responsive audience it really helps things so thank you for a really good session everybody and i'm actually chairing the next session so i will see you back uh, after coffee at 11:45. thank you everyone bye for now see you then <laughs>